Well, good morning and welcome to Bridgeport Chapel. We are glad you've decided to take time out of what I'm sure is a busy schedule to come and worship with us this morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Psalm 113, verses 1 through 5. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord, our God, who is seated on high? Um, I was thinking a little bit about rejoicing and I don't know, sometimes I think it's difficult with all the things that are going on and we get distracted from how significant our relate for those of us that have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, how significant that is. So here's just a handful of things <clears throat> that we could rejoice for. God himself <clears throat> is our father through Christ. We have eternal life through Christ. That's a long time. Jesus has paid for every sin we ever have done or will do with his death on the cross. The Holy Spirit of God dwells in, empowers, comforts, and counsels us if we're in Christ. Our God is our refuge, our strength, and a strong tower. We have unlimited access to the throne of God. I become increasingly aware of how significant that is, that we can come before the Almighty God and petition Him. <clears throat> Nothing will ever separate us from God's love. The angel of the Lord encamps around us 24-7. So God's around us, protecting us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's pretty cool. God is in control of every detail of our lives, even though at times, I know I struggle with this, I think things are out of control, but that's not true for the God of heaven. He is always in control, even though we may not, <clears throat> in our humanness, see it that way. And someday, Jesus will personally wipe away every tear. And we'll be able to praise him and worship him and rejoice in him in all eternity in the place that he's preparing for us. Amen? All right, let's, let's sing together this morning. Um, for those of you who don't know, I am not Scott Heil. <laughs> it was his Sunday, but he's sick, so we can pray for him as he recovers. So I'm filling in, so we're going to dust off the hymnal this morning. And stand with me, if you would, and turn to page 12 as we sing, Praise Him, Praise Him. Uh, sorry. 21. <laughs> which is not praise him, praise him. <clears throat> oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of his grace. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, <coughs> sorrow cease. His music in the sinner's ear, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin, he sets the prisoner Verse 5, last verse. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honor of thy name. Well, let's see if I get this one right. Page 575, leaning on the everlasting arms.
Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you that, it, in fact, we can lean on your everlasting arms. We thank you, Father, that we have eternal rest guaranteed through your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for your salvation. Thank you, Father, for making it attainable for each and every one of us. And thank you, God, for this time this morning where we can come together and we can fellowship and encourage one another, but mostly, God, so we can bring praise and honor to your glorious name. We commit Jonathan to you this morning as he shares from your word. Just use him, Father, as a vessel to share truth this morning and speak through him to into our hearts. Commit the service to you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, hopefully, when you came in, you picked up <clears throat> the announcer, which has a bunch of information. I do want to highlight the insert. Brenda and Autumn Smith are headed to the orphanage down at FFHM in about a week. Uh, they'll be there for a week. I'm very envious. I loved my trips down there. It was a great opportunity, and I look around and see a lot of folks that we got to share that with. So I'm kind of envious of them. We just need to pray for them, that, um, for safety, of course, but also that um, God would use them and their team while they're down there. Um, also, there is <clears throat> uh, a whole bunch of things going on, so I would encourage you to pick this up. I am not going to go through them all in detail, but I am going to mention the Father's Day event next Saturday. Starts at 1 o'clock out at Phil and Carol Jones's place. Um, if you haven't been before, it's a lot of fun. Even if you're not someone who cares much about shooting, it's a great time of fellowship and encouragement, and the food is awesome. The youth group does a great job. So, and it looks like the weather is going to be semi-favorable, so I'd encourage you to come along to that as well. <clears throat> if we could have the ushers come forward, we will take this morning's offering. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I covered it up with my Bible. All right. There is an announcer, or there's a flyer on the bulletin board on your left as you go out. Um, the Fall City High School Class of 2022 Community Baccalaureate Service is being sponsored um, by Mountain Gospel Fellowship. And they've, they've um, encouraged people to come and show their support for the community, but also for the kids in Fall City. And that is um, when, this Wednesday, June 8th at 7 p.m., at Mountain Gospel Fellowship. Um, they have a couple of Christians coming to share, uh, one to speak, and they have a, a extreme tour artist coming in from Florida to share. So um, if you have time, it's a great way to support our community. We are part of the Fall City community, even though we're technically a Dallas address. So we would encourage you, if you're able, to attend that as well. Let's pray for the offering. Gracious Heavenly Father, <clears throat> you are so good to us. Um, You've given us eternal life. You've given us a home in heaven. You've forgiven our sins. You've done so much for us. And you continue to provide for us in our daily needs. We thank you, God, for your provision. We just pray for this offering as it's given, that it would be given as the heart intended, and that you would use it, Father, that you would increase it and use it to increase your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
Ethan, right? Yes, okay. Thank you, Ethan, and your accompanist, Dinah. <laughs> um, I saw a couple of prayer requests that came in after the announcer was done that I thought we would mention, and perhaps I'd get a couple of you to pray. Um, many that have been here a while know Bill and, and Nathel Norfleet. Um, I got that right, Bill, right? Okay. Um, he's at UCLA waiting for a heart transplant. And um, his heart's getting weaker by the day. Um, they've moved him up the list, but um, we need to pray for, for Bill, of course, and the doctors. They search for a heart replacement for him and also Nathel and the rest of the family as they wait on the Lord for this procedure. And the other request was <clears throat> an update on Nathaniel, um, John and Nancy Kerr's son. Um, we've been praying for him for quite a while, and he's not doing well. They're preparing to, um, I think, bring him home on hospice um, as he <clears throat> gets closer to, to meeting his maker and spending his time with Jesus. So we need to pray for John and Nancy. Um, it's been a challenging road as they've <clears throat> walked with Nathaniel through this, <clears throat> and they need the strength of the Lord to carry him through. And pray for Nathaniel for his comfort and, and peace as um, he moves to hospice. Can I get somebody willing to pray for Bill and Nathal? Thank you, Steve. And somebody for John and Nancy? John, thank you. All right, let's pray. Amen. Thank you. Scripture this morning will be in Philippians 4. If you're using a pew Bible, it's page... <clears throat> 982. A little disclaimer, this should have been JD's week because there are names on it. <clears throat> but I cheated and I went to biblespeak.org. Bible so if you're ever having trouble with a name, you can go there. I'm assuming since they have Bible in their name that they must be accurate. So that's what we're going with this morning. We're going with their pronunciation of the names this morning. If you'd stand with me as we read from Philippians Chapter 4, and we'll be reading the first four verses. <clears throat> therefore, brothers, therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companions, Help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Take your hymnal if you would. Turn to page 581. No, that's not right. 12. Now we're going to do 12. Okay. Okay. I pulled my tag out. I totally messed myself up.
everybody. It's good to see. I see some unusual, some new faces. Welcome to those of you who are not unusual in a bad way. Just Thank you, Steve. We like unusual faces. I'm one of them after all. <clears throat> it's good to be together again, as always. It's always a pleasure to come and worship together. Sometimes that means singing together. It means giving together. It means listening to beautiful piano music. It means coming around the Word of God and giving ourselves to Him together. Speaking of that, last week we, um, as we're in Philippians together, we talked about unity a little bit and we're going to talk a little bit more about that today. We're going to talk about unity, and then we're going to shift and talk about rejoicing, just to give you a heads up so you can be ready for that shift. Um, Last week, we remembered some of our freedoms, those who have served in our country. We're grateful for them, for the freedoms we enjoy. We also remembered and, and took time for some memorial of our Lord's death and resurrection as we shared in communion, participated together in the ordinance of communion. It's really a blessing to share this ordinance together. And if you remember, we talked a bit about how not only do we share together, but we share with Christ, somehow fellowshipping and growing in Christ as we partake together. And of course, we do it together intentionally. We fellowship, we share together around the memory of what God has done for us That's part of our worship together. We'll do it again in July, Lord willing. We also came to that first verse of chapter 4 that Steve read in Philippians. And just by way of quick review, Paul brings a conclusion of sorts to most of chapter 3 in that first verse. He's telling them, that audience, the Philippians, he's also telling us, the Lord is telling us, to be aware of those who would lead us astray, who would lead in bad theology. Instead, what does he say? Instead, imitate me and others in the path of Christ. And especially, I think it's important that we pay attention to Paul's goals and even write those goals down in our own words. Put them in front of us as as we strive forward in our Christian living. And then... As we move forward, we see that we're to stand firm in Christ. These goals, these things coming out of chapter 3 lead to that phrase, stand firm in the Lord, stay true, persevere. And we're not to do that alone, we're to do it together. We now come to the last five, the last of five sections. I, I don't know if you remember the outline I've put up there a couple of times, but this, this section, verse 2 out of chapter 4 through the end, is the last of five that we've been looking at in the book of Philippians as a whole. Here we'll see some of the strongest and clearest exhortations 
in this whole letter, things concerning unity, joy, anxiety, obedience, peace, and some other things in there, we'll also see Paul express thanks for the gifts that the Philippians have sent to him and a few greeting and closing remarks toward the end. Um, but let's, let's look at chapter 4, verse 2, and a couple of verses here today. But as we do that, let's ask God to meet us. Father, thank you that we can come together. We really are grateful. It seems normal. It seems traditional to gather. But let us remember that it's not just tradition, that it's not just the thing we ought to do, but it's a blessing to come together, to sacrifice these hours of our day and other hours during the week to be together, to fellowship, to share with one another, to carry each other's burdens, to rejoice with one another, amongst other things. Thank you for the, the letter written to the Philippians so many years ago that you preserved for us, that we can also learn from it, that we can be spoken to, that your word can reveal what it is we're to be about, who we are today in our journey right now. Just bless this time. Please work in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So in verse 2, you can look at it there as you have your Bible open, I hope. It's one of the most personally direct admonitions that we find anywhere in the letters to the churches, not just Philippians, but across the whole of the New Testament. It, Paul says this, I urge Eodia and I urge Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Now, I didn't go to Bible dot whatever it was, Steve, so I'm probably saying those names wrong, but you're going to have to put up with me. At, I, I think J.D. did well last week when he gave us a preview, but I urge Eodia and I urge Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Now, other translations, you might have something like to live in harmony or to settle your disagreement, these two women. As we see this, we understand that there must have been a problem in the body there in Philippi and not an insignificant problem. The issue between these two ladies was more than just a personal disagreement where they could smile and move on even while not seeing eye to eye. There are times when we see things differently, aren't there? We have different preferences, even different ideas about church and to some degree about theology. This is okay. This is normal. Even healthy. But catch this, it's only good, it's only healthy if it's accompanied with a commitment to love one another, a commitment to unity, to harmony, to live with one another. This disagreement that we're seeing must have been dangerous. It must have been selfish, lacking loving commitment to the other. And even now begins to be divisive, I think, on some larger scale than just two women. We should remember the great emphasis on unity in the book, in the letter of Philippians up to this point. From the very beginning, Paul starts off by talking about their partnership with each other. Do you remember that? That's been weeks ago now. Clear back in, in verse 5, 6, and 7 of chapter 1, the partnership they share with him, with each other in the gospel of Christ. In verses 9, 10, and 11 of chapter 1, he prays that they will expand, abound, that they will grow in love for one another. This is the basis of their harmony. Instead of being frightened, he urges them to stand firm in unity. One spirit, one soul contending together for the truth of the gospel. That's 127. In 2 verse 2, Paul calls them to think the same way, have the same love, united in one spirit, with one purpose. It seems that this is a major theme. It's a real part of Christian maturity for us to grasp Continuing in chapter 2, the challenge is there to look beyond your own interests and consider others. Remember this, look to their interests. That's part of humility. Consider the example of Jesus as we get into chapter 2. He humbly gave himself for us. And then even in chapter 3, the instruction, the warning, they're in the context of togetherness much of the time. And then here it comes up again in chapter 4. So I just went over that in order for us to realize it's not a new theme for them. He's been touching on it, touching on it, touching on it. 
So as a major teaching theme, he now gets very specific. And like I said, one of the most, indirect, most direct and personal rebukes to the first century church. Well, I, I thought about starting off today with, I urge Dina Jones and Debbie Rogers to stop quarreling and agree with one another in the Lord. <laughs> now, as far as I know, there's no issue between <laughs> Dina and Debbie, <laughs> but I appreciate you illustrating the point. <laughs> kind of going out on a limb there, but it's, <clears throat> it's something like this. Had this, been, this letter been read publicly and directly? You feel that, don't you? And I think if you were Iodia and Syntyche, you would definitely feel it. It's clearly a need that they had. That's the point. Not to, not to bring somebody into the limelight, but it's, it's a need. I like what a commentator said. This is Moses Silva. Listen to this. Here we have an express and unquestionable rebuke. It tells us a great deal about the seriousness of the Philippian problem that Paul should find it necessary to take such a step. At the same time, the apostle's directness confirms how close he felt to this church. One does not take this sort of risk unless one can depend on the thick cushion of love and trust to absorb the impact of the rebuke. Moreover, it is to the great credit of the Philippian community and to Iodia and Syntyche in particular that Paul considered them mature enough to be able to handle this unusual admonition. I hope you kind of caught that. Think about these two ladies. It's a good chance that they had been part of the church for a long time, maybe even since the beginning. We don't know that, but remember women were the first converts in the Philippian uh, church. I would say it's likely these women were influential. They were leaders in some way in the church. We don't know. Again, we don't know for sure. But we do see from verse 3 that they were definitely believers. Some who had contended alongside Paul for the gospel and whose names were recorded in the book of life. Well, whatever the case, unfortunately, sadly, Iodia and Syntyche were unwilling to reconcile with one another to prioritize love in their relationship over the nature of what they disagreed upon. What did they disagree upon? Well, we don't know that. Maybe it was the color of the carpet. Was it minor points of theology? Some form of prejudice? We don't know. But it's pretty likely that their disagreement involved some stubbornness and some pride. We see also in verse 3, Paul had invited others to come alongside these women and give aid in resolving the issue. They needed counseling, if you will, from their community. It also reveals the disagreement and that this disharmony can go deep, even if it's a small thing, even if it starts off at the, with the problem of the color of the carpet. It's not just personal, it begins to affect the whole church. The ripples from their dispute have now touched others. And there's a good chance of some kind of deep division occurring. Now, have you ever felt any of these stubbornness and pride issues in your own heart? Maybe you felt them from someone else. But I know I have. It's easy for human nature, for us in the flesh to be stubborn, to be prideful. That is in opposition to humility, right? And that leads to being unloving with one another. Have you ever felt like you were in competition with each other? And not a healthy competition in this case. You had to stand out somehow. Just, I, I don't know, think about that one. We're not in competition with each other. To underpin this idea, 1 Corinthians 1.10 says, Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, that there be no division among you, and that you be united with the same understanding and the same conviction. Now again, I don't think this is instructing us that our way of thinking has to be exactly aligned. Our convictions fully match that we're all playing the same note. You all walk over and play the same note on the piano. That's not exactly what's being said. Now, even if you're not a musician, 
you probably appreciate a good musical number or a song. It might be a good good number on the piano, or maybe it's a band or, or a full symphony orchestra. But part of the reason there's so much beauty in that music that you enjoy is because there is diversity. There are different notes. There's melody, there's harmony, there's low, there's high, and other things going on there. There are different instruments in some cases. There are even percussion instruments that are often just making a random noise, but it fits in. It's timed together. It creates something beautiful. So we need diversity. But in this diversity, and catch this, there's no division. That's the key. Love is prioritized over the nature of our disagreements. And remember, discord does not just affect us, you and me, Debbie and Dina, if they're at each other, but the ripples go out and touch many, even to the point of causing division. Like I said earlier, we're not, not going to spend the rest of our time together here. We, we could, and, and it's a great topic to look more at. But I just urge you to look inside. As part of the body of Christ, unity needs to be one of our greatest goals. Ephesians 4.21 calls us to submit to one another in the fear of Christ. How are we doing on that? Do we prioritize love in our relationships over the nature of what we disagree upon? Do you dwell on how you can better love so-and-so? Or do you dwell on the area of your disagreement? We're one with each other, placed by God together in Christ. But He gives us room. He gives us freedom to intentionally work this out in relationship. Isn't that interesting? Well, as you think about this more, and, and we're going to move on to rejoicing, but think about the goals in your life along the, the, the line of unity, and you can check out John 17, 20, and 23 to help you more with that. But let's move on to verse 4 and think about rejoicing. Verse 4, fairly simple, says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Paul is inviting them, he's instructing them, he's teaching them positively, strongly to rejoice. I think this is more than just uh, be happy and have a great day type of an idea. I think you could say he understands what it means to meaningfully rejoice. Remember, he's writing from prison right now. He knows that we were meant for this and what kind of effect it has upon our life together, and even personally. So, what does this rejoicing look like in our lives today? But before we answer that question, what does he mean by rejoice? But right before we get to that question, I want to get a feel for the emphasis of joy or rejoicing in Philippians. I'm trying hard to confuse you here up here. Now, many have said that joy is a great theme in Philippians. You ever heard that? The book of joy, the letter of joy, maybe. At this point, I would say there are other themes that could be classified just as greatly in Philippians, but undoubtedly they are right. Rejoicing or joy is a great theme in this letter. We've talked about it some already. I counted seven verses where the word rejoice is used And two of those verses, it was used twice. Uh, There's at least five instances of the word joy in the letter. And Paul has told the Philippians that he rejoices personally. And he's already urged them to rejoice before, even we get to this section. But now in verse 4 of chapter 4, I think this is perhaps the pinnacle of his desire that the Philippian church rejoice in the Lord. You see the repetition in this short phrase to emphasize the importance of it. Perhaps as you look at the verse there, it's something like this. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And then he anticipates the Philippians' response or possible response, something like, how can we have joy when we have all this stuff going on? We've got opponents Inside, we've got opponents outside the church. 
We have persecution. We even have division in our church. And Paul says again, I'll say it, rejoice. I think the Philippians needed this, but God knows as he preserved it for the revelation for us that we needed as well. So as we look at Philippians and the Bible as a whole, rejoicing stands out as a very important part of life, a necessary part of the life of those of us who are citizens of heaven. So there's some of the emphasis. How about that second question? When the author says, when Paul says to us, when the Holy Spirit says to us, rejoice, what is meant by that? Now, you could give me an answer, and probably you'd be right. You know what it means to rejoice, but let's just look into it a little bit. The word here that's translated rejoice is a verb. It's Cairo. That's not to be confused with the city. It's an action word. It's a choice to rejoice, if you will. It means be glad, be delighted, have joy. Find gladness in the grace of God. Interestingly, there's a connection to the word grace. It's something we should do. It's a choice that we make to rejoice. Now, on the one hand, I don't think that we should feel bad or ashamed for having moments of sadness or grief or even some sorrow in our life. But on the other hand, these cannot be what define us as believers. Because of the reality of our salvation and all that that entails, who we are in Christ, we can rejoice. In the grace of God, we have reason for happiness, for true joy. Sometimes you see this godly joy, and we're looking at what he means by rejoice. You see this godly joy exemplified in the scriptures. Paul is a great one. We already mentioned him, but he's sitting in prison. His health is not great. His retirement is not looking favorable. His circumstances in general are really pretty dire. But it's from this that he testifies of rejoicing in the Lord. He makes a choice to rejoice. We see David's joy multiple times, but there is one instance especially as they brought the ark of God to the capital of Israel. David and the army danced before the Lord with music and praise in rejoicing because of this great action they were taking in bringing the ark of God to home. Now, sometimes rejoicing is evident in that case, even extreme, you could say. But rejoicing is not just a show. It starts in the heart. Listen to the testimony of the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 15, 16. He says, your words were found and I ate them. Your words became a delight to me and the joy of my heart, for I bear your name, Lord God of armies. And you see many other times in the scriptures where those committed to the Lord choose to rejoice. Have you ever known a joyful person? That's not to say that some of you are joyful too. But if, if you know that joyful person, that joy is real, it's not feigned, there's a fantastic attraction to that. I think this is a bit of a start on that question, what is meant by rejoicing? We can continue to work that out, but I'd like to look at the first question I posed a minute ago. What does rejoicing look like in our lives? How does that come out? What do we do? Corey Ten Boom, in The Hiding Place, her book, relates an incident which taught her the principle of rejoicing always. She and her sister Betsy had been transferred to the worst German prison camp they had seen yet, called Ravensbrück. Upon entering the barracks, they found them extremely overcrowded and flea-infested. Their scripture reading that morning in 1 Thessalonians had reminded them to rejoice always, pray constantly, and give thanks in all circumstances. Betsy told Corey to stop and thank the Lord for every detail of their new living quarters. Corey first flatly refused to give thanks for the fleas, but Betsy persisted. She finally succumbed in giving thanks. During the months spent at that camp, they were surprised to find how openly they could hold Bible study and prayer meetings without guard interference. It was several months later 
when they had learned that the guards would not enter the barracks because of the fleas. Well, I have four words to help us track a little bit of what joy might look like in our lives. And this antidote from Corey Ten Boom illustrates the first one. I've already said it, but it's a decision. Rejoicing is a decision. It's a choice to rejoice. In other words, it's not a feeling that I sometimes have and other times don't have. It's not a mood I find myself in or don't. Notice the command is to rejoice always. There will certainly be times when we don't feel like rejoicing. But as we seek the course of action that God has planned for us in Christianity, it's all times that we choose, or we should choose, to rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord, a choice, a decision. To rejoice means that we replace some of the natural habits such as complaining and arguing. Remember Paul's words against those earlier in 2.14? He says, do everything without grumbling and arguing. See the connection there? Instead, always be rejoicing. That's a decision. And it's easy enough to make that decision as we sit here together. But how do we make that decision tomorrow in the moment of despair or frustration or selfishness of however many sorts it works itself out in our circumstances. Well, we've been noticing the goals of Paul as we've worked our way down through chapter 3. Perhaps, I suggest, rejoicing should be one of the goals in our life. It's a, if it's a conscious decision, if it's a choice that we have to make, we may need a personal goal to help us out. Is that appropriate for you? Do you need a written goal helping you, reminding you to rejoice? I'll be honest for myself, I need that. I need some practical assistance in order to pursue the principle of rejoicing in my life. That doesn't come real natural for me. Well, the second word to help us with this idea of what rejoicing looks like in our lives is dependence. Now, real rejoicing is not fake or artificial. Real rejoicing is dependent. It arises out of something. We are stimulated to rejoice because of something. In our lives, check this out, rejoicing is dependent upon our circumstances. But to clarify, not all our circumstances. Originally, I was going to say that our joy is not dependent upon our circumstances. And in so many ways, that's true. This is related to the decision, the first one, the choice to rejoice. Our rejoicing, our joy does not depend upon what is happening around us in the world or what things are happening to us, personal circumstances in life. I want to rejoice so much of the time, but I'm so easily distracted by the world or by less than, e than, than ideal circumstances in my life. We can be distracted by too much. We live in a wealthy society. What we don't have, we can be distressed about, and we can be stressed about what we do have. On the flip side, we can be distracted by hardship, fears, anxiety, despair, tragedy, even want. But these are not the circumstances that we are to depend on for joy. Our rejoicing arises out of other wondrous circumstances, such things as chosen by God. And Steve brought a, he got us started with a great list this morning, adopted into his family loved consistently and deeply by Him, sealed by the Holy Spirit in, in Him, graciously being sanctified day by day, owning a hope of heaven one day. You get the idea. There's, there's a multitude. We have so many other blessings in Him to motivate us to rejoice. These are real circumstances, the ones that should be defining our lives. We are dependent on these circumstances for our rejoicing 
and make a choice to rejoice as we put our focus here. John Wesley was about 21 years of age when he went to Oxford University. He came from a Christian home and he was gifted with a keen mind and good looks. Yet in those days, he was a bit snobbish and sarcastic. One night, however, something happened that set in motion a change in Wesley's heart. While speaking with a porter, he discovered that the poor fellow had only one coat and lived in such impoverished conditions that he didn't even have a bed. Yet he was an unusually happy person, filled with gratitude. Gratitude to God. Well, Wesley, being immature, thoughtlessly joked about the man's misfortunes and said, well, what else do you have to thank God for? He said, even with a touch of sarcasm, well, the porter smiled and in a spirit of meekness replied with joy, I thank him that he has given me a life and being, a heart to love him, and above all, a constant desire to serve him. Deeply moved, Wesley recognized that this man knew the meaning of true thankfulness and joy. Part of learning to rejoice, and we're learning to rejoice, is dependence upon the wonderful circumstances that we can claim in God. We cannot and we must not depend upon earthly circumstances for our joy. Some years back, a study found almost no correlation between income levels and happiness. Between 1957 and 1990, income levels in the U.S. doubled Yet in the same period, people's levels of happiness did not increase. In fact, reports of depression actually increased tenfold. Incidents of divorce, suicide, alcoholism, and drug abuse also rose dramatically. Now this is not to say that money or wealth or income is the cause of the trouble, but it is to say that our decision about our dependence is a cause of either rejoicing or trouble. We need to make a choice concerning what kinds of circumstances we are depending on to motivate our rejoicing. Listen to this out of Ephesians 1, verse 7 and 8. In Him, that is in Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace that He richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. That's just a scripture a piece there's so many other scriptures we could read but these are the circumstances that we are depending upon to elicit joy in our lives to motivate rejoicing depend upon god not upon the things around you so we've seen decision we've seen we've looked at dependence what kind of circumstances are we dependent upon for our joy and the third one to consider, the third D is determinative. Rejoicing, follow me on this one, it has a determinative effect on us. As we rejoice, it changes us. It determines our attitude and our course of life. Rejoicing doesn't save us. It doesn't bring us favor with God per se, but as we submit to God, and cultivate and practice an attitude of rejoicing, it affects our lives for the better. It has a determinative effect. Quite a few years back, a man named Norman Cousins was hospitalized with a rare crippling form of arthritis. When he was diagnosed as incurable, Cousins checked out of the hospital. Aware of the harmful effects that negative emotions can have on the body, Cousins reasoned the reverse was also true. So he borrowed a movie projector, you can see this is quite a few years back, and prescribed his own treatment, consisting of Marx Brothers films and old candid camera reruns. It didn't take long for him to discover that 10 minutes of laughter provided two hours of pain-free sleep. Amazingly, over time, his debilitating disease was eventually reversed. Rejoicing is determinative, even physically. It is said that joy brings benefits to the body, including boosting the immune system, fighting stress and pain, and even bringing down heart rate and blood pressure. 
They even say that forcing a smile can trick your brain into thinking that you're happy. (laughs) Maybe it'll convince you too, I don't know. Proverbs 17, 22 says, A joyful heart is, and you know it, a good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. We are admitting here, by the way, and recognizing that God knew what he was doing with this command to rejoice always. But beyond the physical effects, rejoicing brings benefits. It has a determinative effect in orienting our perspective. Rejoicing in the Lord will cast life's issues in the proper light. Does that make sense? I think a pattern of rejoicing begins to overwhelm us with the proper viewpoint on things that we face in life, bringing peace, bringing rest, even energy and excitement. On the flip side, a pattern of living without rejoicing can lead to being overwhelmed with fear or stress or anger or despondency or other things. Proverbs 15, 13, a joyful heart makes a face cheerful, but a sad heart produces a broken spirit. A choice to rejoice helps cast life's issues in the proper light and determines our outlook and our attitude. As a third century man was anticipating death, he penned these last words to a friend. It's a bad world, an incredibly bad world. But I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. These people are the Christians, and I am one of them. The last word I want to look at to help us think about this idea of what rejoicing looks like in our lives, how it plays out in our lives, is the word dwell. For us to have true joy, and maybe this goes without saying, but we need to dwell in the presence of the Lord. We talked about our joy being dependent upon what He has done, about who He is and what He will do for us. But how do we know that and how do we feel those truths and believe them if we're not dwelling with Him? Listen to what King David said in 1 Chronicles 16 and verse 27. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. I like the way he says that. Strength and joy are in his place. Psalm 1611, you reveal the path of life to me in your presence is abundant joy. And at your right hand are eternal pleasures. And how does this look? As we want to rejoice in the Lord, it means... We want to dwell with Him. It means spending time with Him, desiring Him. It means knowing Him, dwelling with Him in His presence. It means being in His Word and in prayer daily. We want to dwell with Him. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. What does this look like in our lives? I'm hopeful that these four D's can help us get a handle on what that looks like. To rejoice is a decision, a choice to rejoice. True rejoicing is dependent upon circumstances. What circumstances? Those ones we find in God. We are loved by Him, we are saved by Him, we have hope through Him. And the list goes on. Rejoicing is determinative. It helps determine our outlook and perspective on life and may even lead to physical benefits. And last, to rejoice means we want to dwell with the Lord, to know Him, to spend time with Him, and to rejoice with Him. So what kinds of goals do you have or do you need for rejoicing in your life? Perhaps these four Ds can get you started 
I'm sure you can add more. They don't have to start with D. But choose to set goals so that rejoicing becomes a part of your life, a central part of who you are as a citizen of heaven. Steve, would you come and lead us in a final song? And let's pray as, as he comes. God, we thank you for this kind of one of the most clear directives in the scripture. Sometimes we like those, sometimes we don't like those, but we know this comes for our good from your loving heart for us to rejoice. That doesn't come naturally so much of the time. But thank you for the circumstances that we have in Christ that allow us to have good reason to rejoice. I pray that you would let, it, let us dwell there as we seek you, as we even hopefully set some goals to further pursue you, to know you, to dwell with you. And then we look forward to those determinative effects as we, our perspective is aligned on the life that we have, as we look forward to hope and eternity with you. Thank you for those in our lives that do rejoice, that provide an example for this. Thank you for joy that you've allowed to be part of our life and our existence. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, take your hymnals if you would. Turn to page 581. Stand with me as we close with Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Go and make the choice to rejoice. <laughs>